Um, I read that this conference is about uh, Earth in building. Uh, I think Earth stands for more than that. In Aboriginal Australia, to walk barefooted, to sit down, means engagement with our great giver and moderator, Mother Earth. Earth speaks to us. She tells the stories of eons and absorbs the punishment of tempests, of floods and winds, of man's markings. We think she's forgiving, whatever she's special. To build with her, to use her in crafting shelter, pull shelter back into the triumvirate of our basic human needs, food, sex and shelter. Earth is a natural resource available to us all, potentially without cost. Traditionally, in much of the world, this was so. Yet, at least in Australia, earth building remains a minor player in our urban fabric. Perhaps it's the industrialisation of construction and its increasing systemisation, together with regulation that militate against its wider use. To tell you how we fell in love with using rammed earth, I'll need to spin a bit of a yarn about our practice journey and our evolution, the evolution of our values. It largely comes from a piece we wrote a few years back, at the time entitled Tropo, 35 Years of Going Backwards. We begin with our University of Adelaide student trip of discovery around Oz. That's us, Tropo co-founder Adrian is the A, and moi, the E, in the middle of our fellow travellers, Justin Hill, um, uh, Kerry Hill's co-director these days, and James Hayter, uh, famous landscape architect, currently reshaping the edge of Oak Billy Griffin. Um, we begin, uh, oh yeah, we were charged uh, by the 1960s words of Professor Max Freeland. A country's architecture is a near perfect record of its history. Every building captures in physical form the climate and resources of a country's geography and the conditions of its society. Every building explains the time and place in which it was built. In so much of regional Australia, we noted that the architecture was not driven by style. And nowhere did this response produce more abstract, weird and wonderful buildings than in the tropical north. You could live in, around and even under the thing known as a house. And the vaguer the division of space within, the more it fitted the needs of climate and fluctuating numbers of people drifting through. Not only was there little, little division within, but there was also a little division to the outside world. On a shelter number line, buildings up north seem to fit somewhere down towards the end where shelter is afforded by a tree. We wrote about these things in, believe it or not, the first history of the Australian vernacular, Influences in Regional Architecture. We returned to Darwin in 79 and dug into the history of top-end housing, which runs something like this. At first, the town was built from what was locally available, split-woven bamboo, local cypress, and also from the lightest materials that could be brought by ship or on a camel's back, usually canvas and corrugated iron. This little nest was for Qantas pilots and posties en route to London. In 1911, the Territory came under Commonwealth control and senior public servants were granted one of these. The first of a series of proudly North Australian houses, houses that breathe in the close tropical air. In time, timber slats screens gave way to flywire and louvers, and generally more industrialised wall and window systems. World War II brought devastation from Japanese bombing raids, but the city regrouped, the tropical house was reborn, albeit with more austere aesthetic, but it carried over the basics of simple planning, elevated construction, easily transported lightweight materials, fully openable walls. Then on Christmas Eve 74, Cyclone Tracy flattened the place. The the rebirth wasn't so breathe easy. Lessons from the past seem lost, and that's where we stepped in. <laughs> Armed with a government grant to study the history of tropical housing, two bikes and two deck chairs, we took the opportunity to also set up private practice. We started with a manifesto, hunkers and pith helmets, good principles of tropical house design. It included an ABCD of how to passively design to achieve comfort in the tropics. A, orient buildings with prevailing breezes and detail for cross ventilation. B, 
allow for the escape of rising heat. C, build lightweight so the day's heat can, can be given up at night. And D, shelter walls and openings. Working at unbelievably cheap rates for unbelievably brave clients in a young city on the edge of ancient yet surviving Aboriginal lands, we created a swag of simple but fun new but old houses. We'll start with the green can, named after Darwin's favourite beer, BB, which of course comes in a very beautiful emerald coloured green can. Although it only came forth from the government's low-cost housing competition, defeated by such uh, such boxes as the modulaire and the banks here, the green can soon became infamous. It divided opinion, creating fury on talkback radio for its overt connection with the outdoors and its veranda boards that had come inside, not to mention its ability to catch cobwebs. The Australian picked up the story and sliding the top prize winners ran front page with Darwin states its housing future on green can. The program for the house was simple. A mostly timber portal frame structure enabled spaces to be divided at need and wet areas were grouped in a surface zone. The manifesto had been followed to the letter. As cheap as the green can was, down in Coconut Grove in a new subdivision that was to become later known as Tropoville, we were going cheaper. Eight punters, a couple of builders and lots of neighbour labour made it all happen. We started with our own house, eventually become our own family house. Uh, we bought, <coughs> we bought it in exchange for a model for a new project, uh, placed it on this its third site, pulled it apart and with friends put it back together with uh, bits and pieces stolen from elsewhere in Darwin. Then there were two orders for green cans, both elevated. <coughs> then still on a roll with roofs, literally, getting braver at making broad openings from off-the-shelf doors, and here trying our hand at a slatted house 1986 style. Bernard Carr's house was a grand, has a grand entry, but inside it was really just a shed. Marcus's house was the cheapest. This is the view from the front door. But a small footprint was locked enough to yield a mezzanine, and so fit a young family within its roomless volume. The split woven bamboo gables were imported from Indonesia in a neighbour's yacht, and shutters and other fitments were owner built. Community based delivery got our work over the line back then. Houses with simple volumes and few partitions, even over three levels. And also further afield, a bush school for an Aboriginal outstation in Arnhem Land with a teacher in the penthouse. It all shut us down at uh, walkabout times. These examples up until 1982 were only a few of the <coughs> 150 projects. Then came the proposition that is the theory of the 10th line, which goes like this. Uh, so if you take the drawing of a cube, you'll quickly count that it has nine lines, it seems solid, an object with contained in a space. It tends to lead to architecture like this. And for cred, uh, indeed, I have to announced that the theory was conceived in a bar in Rome. Uh, so now we draw the tenth line, and we don't need to draw any more for the objects already exploded. It's now a frame. Outside and inside merge. Armed with this thinking, let's look again at the way we go about making architecture. Let's consider design from four angles. Firstly, let's consider things accommodationally. Ninth line adherence, think of rooms, each being thought to occupy a specific defined activity. However, tenth line theory leads one to merge space, to add just the least divisions, and even then only at certain times. This sort of space is a lot more adaptable, and in a house it can respond to people's strange and wonderful activities, like kids playing en masse, incredible projects and studies on the go, Christmas lunch, partying, then let's think contextually. The nine-line cube sits rather dissociated from its environment. It speaks of disinterest in place. Let's shift our thinking beyond the built object to the space around, perhaps between buildings. Consider, for example, the role that functional landscape might play, shade and cooling paths for breezes, or as a windbreak, creating privacy, a path for water flow. Now we're face to face with environment. And to maximise this opportunity, we need a dynamic architectural response. 
an architecture of adjustable skins connecting indoors and out, an architecture that responds to the morning, the <coughs> evening, the season, the moment that is. And then through the technical filter, these days comfort is at one's fingertips. All we need is a switch. Of course, this nine-line answer doesn't sit well with reducing the production of greenhouse gases. We reckon there's also a little prompt to create interesting buildings. In the tropics, an architecture built around the theory of the 10th line will incorporate devices to deliver on the ABCD. We get louvers, shutters, flat screens, big eaves, sunshades, and up above myriad vents. Inside, fans are whirring or punk is flapping. Fun added to architecture for free. Fourthly, thinking materially, we get architecture for effect, get grandiose decorated cubes, all with masses of material. Tenth line thinking strips away what we don't need and makes us question just how much to add to a frame to shelter and function. Simply put, less is more, less building to maintain, more resources left in the ground, more trees left photosynthesising. By now we're two of five directors and two of many, many people who've given Tropo life strewn through five practices in five diverse corners of this continent. And by now I pause to raise a glass to the thousand or so punters who claim we've brought them happiness over some 38 years. In that extended time from the young beginnings in Darwin, we've come to build in many weird and wonderful places around the country. From glamorous beach locales to things more urban and also ridiculously remote. We veered and lurched from the tropics to the middle to the south. And we saw black and white Australia. And yes, we mean that because indeed it seems increasingly we're creating our own double standards in this country. We mused on a new town for Darwin where down the main street we might still have grass fires to celebrate the dry season and would walk in shade to the pub to view over a retained wetland that still works to filter site water runoff to a pristine creek. There were structures that were like sea creatures and outrigger canoes like swishing fish, others more like eagles. There were simple structures and structures for blokes who initiation requires them to stop sealing pans with their heads. <laughs> and there was one illegal structure, at least that we're owning up to. Uh, let's pause a little on all this making. For architecture is indeed about making. Making is always to some extent considered. It requires conceiving, but when we're in the midst of it, with our hands and the tools and at one with the material, it also becomes a spontaneous, <coughs> reflexive thing. There's a richness of play between mind and hands. We'd say making is about head, hands and heart. Inseparable <coughs> from rich and purposeful creativity, together they explain our humanity. Together, equally engaged, they might make art as opposed to copy. The head is calculating our slippery lateral mind, our memory. It is plugged into our inherited knowledge and traditions and it brings science to our making. Our hands take us to surprising places. When we pick up a musical instrument, a trowel, a brush, if we're loose there's no knowing where it will end. But without a heart that has feeling, that is caring and socially considerate, we will not proceed with good purpose and a heart that can feel the spirit of place and moment and sense and feel with the possible and give it its all, that heart will really take us somewhere. Making needs all these things. It's a human thing, a people thing. Making is by people, for people. But people are not without a planet that sustains them and the planet is not a dumb ball of stardust. It's an intricate web of life in strange and myriad form. It is earth, air, fire, water. It has power. It turns evenly yet unpredictably and at times it seems to turn on us, destroying and again renewing, nourishing us. We can't separate our well-being from this sustaining web that is our earth. Uh, as Big Bill Nigy, Kapiti Man says in his poem, Feeling, <coughs> what am I, big, big real voice? Uh, Pretty smooth. What about you and me, sweet skin? 
Might be sunburn you, but you got white no matter me. But this is the story. You can't split him. You can't change him. You can't do anything. This story, you've got to keep him in your feeling. Tree for us, eagle, anything. Eagle, bird, animal, rock. This is the story. Listen carefully, careful. And the spirit can come in your feeling. And you will feel it. Anyone that. I feel it. My body, same as you. I'm telling you this because of the land for us. Never change around, never change. Place, places for us, earth for us. Star, moon, tree, animal. No matter what sort of animal, bird or snake. All that animal, same like us. Our friend there. This story, he can listen carefully, carefully. And how you want to feel on your feeling, this story is coming through your body. You go right down foot and head, fingernail and blood, through the heart. And you can feel it because it will come right through it. And when you sleep, you might dream something. In this material world, it's hard to believe we're from the same universal tree as Big Bill's mob, and of the same blood as each of our forebears. Indeed, by comparison to us, how little our parents and grandparents lived with how little so many people on this planet still live with. How different those values of consumption, yet same species. We'd argue habits of the past hold the low energy future, not the now. But now in the way we behave, the climate is seen as an enemy to be tamed. We must air condition a comfy wrap for ourselves, in our homes, our workplaces and when mobile. And whilst air conditioning are pace, in order to convince ourselves we're curating the planet, to pat ourselves on the back for tackling greenhouse gas emissions, within the building code we've developed an approval framework that is predicated on inclusion of this energy heavy air conditioning. And to try and ease that energy heaviness, a 100% sealed, heavily insulated box, an ESCI, has become the ultimate energy efficient building paradigm. Come on, let's call it the Emperor is here, and he is without clothes. <laughs> sure, flood, drought and fire colour this country. And then there's storms and cyclones, epitomised most extremely by Darwin's Tracy. Crescent and Xavier Herbert's 1938 warning that here in the top end, nature looms larger than man. Yet despite all that, <coughs> climate is not that of Mars or Venus. It's what supports us. The atmospheric cloak that enabled us to be here at all. In most parts of Australia, it's Dan Gorgeous 300 days of the year and a memorable, socially binding talking point for the rest. <laughs> and as Max, Max Pritchard, architect elder, once told students in the temperate south, if you're cold, put on a jumper. Perhaps in the north, it's get out of here. <laughs> So this approach to making architecture that we're arguing for is people-centred. It's humble in its interdependency with nature. As such, it's bound to be a place. And what a shelter, its core purpose. Food, sex and shelter. These three things are what all creatures need and do. The great triumvirate that enables life before we get to the cafe to chat, or to the opera, or oval. All creatures need and spend much time in getting the food that fuels them. All creatures copulate in order to pass on their genes, and many do so to cement nurturing relationships. And no creature can get through the passage of day and night and the seasons and support its hunting or gathering or its rooting and nurturing without shelter. But what is shelter? We skip over this too much as architects, although we imagine that's where we fit in. We at Tropo say it's not an artefact. It's not an object, and certainly it's not about style or decoration. Controversially, perhaps, we think it's not much about that in inert lump called a building. Shelter proffers the same ideal for all creatures. We don't always shelter from things. We shelter to be able to better interact with our surroundings. Think of an eagle perched along from its historic nest, waiting for the moment to die to kill. Think of a fish parked in sea grasses, awaiting the passing of a new tide's passing nourishments. 
Think of a possum calling, snoozing in a tree hollow or your roof space, connected to, in a trice to its aerial network, awaiting a night's gambling. Shelter is not just refuge, it's about being able to be projected out there and of course being able to retreat from out there. At its best, shelter enables us to interact with the world in winning ways, as well as to offer a means of revival. Shelter is potentially a dynamic and energising force in our lives and it's a potentially didactic and educative one. Locked away, disconnected from our environment, how can we hope to be wise to all of the social opportunities around us? How can we draw most richly from the intricacy of the planet's web of life that sustains us? How can we give back by curating the place where we live? Can nourishing food be from a production line, chemically fabricated? In that, where's the mind food, the connection with farmer, land and season? Can nourishing sex be simply physical, anonymous, out of a manual? In that, where's the scope for, richly and uh, for caring richly and empathetically for others, for building love? Can nourishing shelter be an inoperable sealed bubble white box? In that, where's the scope for choosing between retreat and engagement, and all the degrees between? Architecture that understands shelter as a basic dynamic in our lives will go beyond the merely tangible building. It will deliver a program that energises us, gives us scope to fully engage and live in mindfully. Such an architecture will extend our environmental connection and our social opportunity. In fact, our planets, for our planets and diverse society's sake, really it must. These are the sort of thing, this is the sort of thing that development plans and building codes should state on page one. If those things are delivered, what else comes near to mattering? Time to get to around Earth. <coughs> you might have seen some glimpses speeding by, uh, but here's some more, but nowhere near as uh, much as what you just saw from Luigi. Uh, you don't need me to tell you about how beautiful Earth is as a material. And uh, I can't show you crazy pictures of, or pictures of crazy wild and wonderful things that stretch craftsmanship or engineering and earth construction like in the building we're sitting in or what Rick has shown us. Instead I thought I'd share with you where and how as a practicing architect we choose to use ram, ram earth. And for us it's always ram earth as that's the type of earth building we know and we have the trade available to us. You don't need to travel far from the coast and the top end for daytime temperatures to rise and nighttime temperatures to fall from the sea moderated littoral. Uh, so there, mostly visible to the outside, we begin to use ram earth for thermal balance, taking care to keep separation from the daytime sun and torrential rain. Establishing practices in the south in the late 90s gave us a real chance to adapt our thinking to seeking environmental connection to a Mediterranean climate, more need for thermal balance, and a context with a tradition of masonry building. The topics for passive thermal design remain the same, but the responses adjust. Now we wholeheartedly want thermal mass, insulation. Now we need ability to control rather than 24-7 demand cross ventilation and rising heat. We'll still take thermal reflectivity and sheltering of openings and walls. And even more so, we find a need for adjustable skins as we cycle through the seasons and days with widely changeable characteristics and temperatures. Round Earth to deliver thermal mass works well for us there, and we find it very cost effective by comparison to other masonries. Round earth, um, but we have our hurdles in integrating round earth in our architecture everywhere as we would like. Firstly, there's conservative engineering perceptions, including for the application of the earthquake code, leaving us with the strength of uh, round earth walls unaccounted for, and worse, often requiring to be stabilised by steel superstructure. Then there's the perception of some punters as to the round earth's durability, until we remind them that they too will uh, eventually act, need to age gracefully. 
uninsulated by the code's energy efficiency framework, it doesn't count well, so we need to offset that. Another hurdle can be the number of subcontractors. We have only two in Adelaide, for example, which can affect construction program and cost. In remote areas, should labour be imported, travel and accommodation become significant on cost, so there's a push to reduce trades. It's hard to advocate for rammed earth in that context. In remote and not so remote areas, should a prefab well, should prefabricated systems um, be demanded? This will rely on lightweight systems with no opportunity for rammed earth, unless it comes in the project site works after building delivery. So with considered purpose, we use rammed earth where we have trade availability, can get bang for buck, and where we have to, to get it over the line, we twist arms and lie at approval time. I'd like to conclude by dwelling on the car crash that is the building code, energy efficiency and earth building. We come at passive thermal design by researching historical precedent and reading pioneers in eliciting design response to climate, such as Stephen Zockelai. And learning from internationally famous Australian architects, such as Paul Fleros, Ben Merkett and Rick Lepastria. Glenn says we should trim our buildings for the moment like we trim a yacht. Oh, that's his mate Rick in the yacht. It's great to know that today the principles of passive thermal design are so broadly out there in our learning institutions, and even in government publications, which makes it only all the more absurd that we have an approach to energy efficiency that obstructs their information <coughs> implementation in the building code. To illustrate the conundrum, up north, our free running is that is a passive thermal tropical buildings regionally that are regionally proud and built on tradition by the coast energy efficiency modelling would in fact receive, receive zero out of ten stars though they're, this, they're sustainable architectural award winners. In the Territory, a government committee I chaired pondered building code hurdles to approvals for free-running dwelling design. We considered dwellings that might be purely free-running, combinations of conditions and free-running, and mixed-mode dwellings, that is, uh, dwellings that are designed to run without, but also can thoroughly seal and insulate to run efficiently in air-conditioning mode. We determined that approval is a nightmare for any of the above. Only devious means or exemptions offer an answer. Let's reshape the provisions of the code. Let's be more holistic in our approach. To begin, here's just two absurdities. Astoundingly, the code's modelling machine gives no credit for functional landscape enabling heat, heat shielding or sinking. The code shies away from use of the comfort word anywhere, but why else does one heat or cool? It's not for the benefit of the building's fabric's well-being. Is it that it's too problematic for the code's adopted narrow computer modelling approach? Too subjective? You bet it is. At this conference, there is a rattling of the gates, and among academics and the architectural fraternity, it is well echoed. The Australian Building Codes Board must open up the approach to energy efficiency again. Stephen Dobson has talked to me of happy houses, that beautiful natural materials of the earth make for happy houses. I like that, and I'd add, with happy, hard-working landscapes. Stephen is supported by the work of over 40 years by our friend, the University of Adelaide's Dr Terry Williamson and many others within and outside Australia in their research of preferences around thermal comfort. He <coughs> finds a strong correlation between people dwelling in rammed earth houses and un- or minimally air-conditioned houses. And that these are people, that these people, these are people that are, uh, let me get that right, that are uh, usually therm thermally comfortable or happy to be a little discomforted because they're happy about their dwelling even when empirical data drawn from the same dwelling suggests that wide divergence from the comfort norms is what is happening. Thermal comfort is perceptual, Terry would underline. And so these people use way less energy than the average. 
But we have a building code that presumes air conditioning and obstructs approval for free running passive thermal dwellings. In the, contact, in the context of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as Dr Williamson asserts, surely those who prefer to generally make do without air conditioning, like their forebears for tens of millennia, should be empowered rather than apologetic for their good environmental intentions. To boot, there are emerging studies proving the obvious, that without climatic adaptation, we're increasingly in danger of suffering increased incidents of thermal stress. This is already a topic of climate change and a problem for when our summer power systems fail, especially if you live in an estuary. In any case, the report cards in on the built results of the code's energy efficiency approach. The National Energy Efficiency Building Project report of November 2014 details failure at length. This government report matches our committee's anecdotal findings and failure is right down the implementation chain. One, most project building doesn't engage with architects and serious design professionals if they're, theoretically are ed educated in design for climate, energy efficiency and the building code. Two, there is no regulation of energy assessors. Three, whilst there are talented and highly professional assessors, much computer modelling can be demonstrated to be untrustworthy, down to offshore online assessments to collude with developer demands. Developers who pay the bill. Four, <coughs> certifiers aren't skilled or required to assess the assessment. Five, builders aren't trained to supervise trades in energy efficiency implementation. Six, trades aren't required to be trained to integrate energy efficiency knowledge. Seven, some details of construction fall between stools when it comes to trade scopes. Eight, certifiers aren't trained for what to look for in site inspections. And in some states, there are no inspections by certifiers at all anyway, and nowhere are any required uh, to be involved in that level of detail. Nine, Joanne Public is not expected to comprehend constructional energy efficiency, nor demand it. But presently in Australia, at sale time, there is little market interest in and no requirement for disclosure of energy ratings. On top of that, we all know the more you use it, the more you, you, the more you get used to using it, and uh, more often and stronger. Wind it up, wind it down, in the land of plenty, bugger the paltry cost differential. Leave it run with doors open while we're at it. We're assessing the wrong things. We should be assessing industry and users. Better to curb energy use by methods such as placing imposts that rise exponentially on those that build or use to excess. Maybe we start with embodied energy. At development time, against accommodation yield, perhaps we levy against dwelling size and material quantum and embodied energy attributes. And if we retain energy efficiency criteria in the code, maybe we improve on that embodied measure of energy efficiency alone, or at least give credit for it. Turning to power use, let's charge it at steeply increasing rates beyond a benchmark use. But yes, let's reassess the code too. Let's take a more holistic approach to energy efficiency. In the steps of big build, maybe the theory of the 10th line will lead us there. I'll leave you to contemplate where Earth fits in all that. <laughs>